Hello, we are Group 12 and our case study is on the cultural conflict in Sony Ericsson's joint venture. Firstly, let us describe how the merger of Sony Ericsson came to be. Before the merger, Ericsson was suffering from severe problems experiencing falling market share even when they were the third largest company in the industry. They were unable to produce phones for cheap and even suffered from a major supply slowdown for several months. For Sony, they were an electronics giant with expertise in consumer goods. But they had a small presence in the mobile phone market. Therefore, the two companies had complementary resources and merger seemed beneficial. The company's mission was to be the best in the industry and they had a good buzz around their products. But this did not last long. Their products were not selling well in comparison to Nokia and the fact that smartphones were on the rise. However, they remained hopeful regardless. As a result, the difference in management cultures from both companies was difficult to understand and respect in such times of uncertainty. The merger eventually led to the closure of the company with Sony buying out Ericsson's share as the company failed to reconcile their cultural differences in the face of cutthroat competition. Okay, so now I'll move on to the analysis of this case. Firstly, the perspectives of both parties were identified as the motivations of the merger between Sony and Ericsson were strong and apparent in terms of benefits brought to one another. Sony excelled in product design and the entertainment industry, while Ericsson had expertise in mobile and broadband internet communications. Hence, the merger acted as a springboard to produce greater results. As for communication dynamics, it was a 50-50 joint venture whereby no one was empowered to execute or implement decisions by themselves, leading to a high level of uncertainty with critical issues left in a state of ambiguity and hence Sony Ericsson's production development division suffered. With the decision-making styles to be identified as collaborating or compromising, it led to slow processes of introducing new products in a fast-changing consumer market, while parties acted in ways most beneficial to themselves and only provided temporary resolutions to dispute. As for culture, Japan possesses a high-context culture whereby they value discrete behaviour and preserve harmony, while Sweden, being a low-context culture, values honesty and are more direct. Hence, this public statement made by Ericsson's then-CEO Helmstrom might have soured their working relationship. The explicitly coded meaning of statement could have merely meant that Helmstrom desires Sony Ericsson to do better by stating facts from a business pragmatic point of view. However, the Japanese could have interpreted an implicit meaning from the words, thinking that the Swedish were criticizing their work results or not valuing the working relationship between them, hence leading to misinterpretations due to cultural differences. Japan had higher uncertainty avoidance and they avoided risk-taking during product design. They valued traditions and resisted change. This was detrimental because the phone market was fast-changing and competitive. They were overshadowed by their competitors and unable to achieve target goals or make profits for some time. Additionally, Japan had a short-term orientation while Sweden had a long-term orientation. Based on employees' personal interviews, the Japanese were more focused on short-term successes and immediate production of results. On the other hand, the Swedes looked towards future gains and may disregard short-term losses in order to achieve that. Next, Japan placed higher emphasis on masculine traits, while Sweden placed higher emphasis on feminine traits. The Japanese prefer assertiveness and places greater stress on their careers. They reported that they were raised with a live-to-work concept and are prepared to work a lot. However, the Swedes prefer cooperation and stresses more on life quality. Lastly, the Japanese were more collectivistic than the Swedes. The Japanese employees reported that they performed best in groups and tend towards collective decision-making. On the other hand, the Swedes were more task-oriented, placing greater importance on task and company goals. However, in general, both cultural groups hold the same attitudes towards cooperation and all preferred to work in teams, although that depended on the related task. Now, we will explain our suggestions for resolution of this conflict. Sony Ericsson previously attempted to establish a third culture combining aspects of Sony Ericsson and the host country UK's culture. However, it more closely resembled Ericsson rather than Sony's culture, resulting in a general difficulty in amalgamating working styles of both types of employees. Our group proposes that for a more successful joint venture, 
Sony Ericsson could have worked on a long-term orientation towards building relationships of trust and transparency. These solutions we present target the executive and employee levels. Before merger, the executives could bridge cultural differences in the organizational aspect by setting down clear expectations and goals. They could clarify the joint venture's desired indicators of progress in the short term and long term. Such a commitment to cultural integration helps them to achieve stronger cultural congruence. Furthermore, instead of a 50-50 joint venture, they could have appointed a sole executive for more effective conflict negotiation. The executive should have a dominating stance for negotiation and be oriented to achieving set company goals. This would enable Sony Ericsson to make swift decisions in a quick changing phone market. Going beyond strategies targeted at the executive level, we propose that Sony Ericsson should also have cultural communication competence workshops before and during the merger. This program aims to achieve the following objectives. To transmit basic knowledge of the other cultural group, not to use them to stereotype, but to promote more mutual understanding. There will also be focused on aspects of communication such as cultural related jokes and non-verbal communication, as they can also affect interaction between individuals from the two cultures. The program aims to also foster receptivity while lessening conformity pressure. Doing so promotes the celebration of diversity which sets the stage for collaboration and innovation. We suggest also that instead of a melting pot approach, the third culture should be more multiculturally oriented. This allows for cultural diversity to be valued as a resource such that both the cultural groups perceive that the other has knowledge and skills to complement their own. With better working relationships, organizational culture distance could be bridged. This encourages equitable participation by both groups, taking full advantage of the benefits that this merger could have brought about. Lastly, there can be, feed there can be a feedback system in place where employees regularly give their comments and suggestions about the activities they had to take part in. This provides a real-time feedback for the effectiveness of these programs and executives can then keep refining it by retaining well-received activities and removing those with poor feedback. This allows the programs to be refined into one that is more targeted and effective. As such, this provides a more rounded implementation which would have a higher probability of success. And with that, we have come to the end of the presentation. Thank you for your time and attention. Bye!